Welcome everyone. Hi, I'm DJ Wells from Mensa Medical and the Mensa Research Institute and thank you for joining us. I see people are signing in and this is the fourth in a series of four webinars where uh, we've been joined by Dr. Albert Mensa and nutritionist Samantha Gilbert talking about ways that we can boost our immune health, uh, boost our immune strength, uh, as a first line of defense against the COVID outbreak. Uh, and Dr. Mensa and, and, and Sammy have shared some great insight over these past three weeks, and I'm sure they've got lots more to share again here today. Um, before we let, before we just turn them loose, what we've done in the past is we've turned the two of them loose, let them have a conversation for about a half hour, 40 minutes, uh, and then we've brought in questions as you've had a chance to hear what they were saying, you've started asking questions. And of course you can do that again today as well. Uh, make sure you use the Q&A tab that's at the bottom of the webinar screen and type your questions in. We'll get them answered as quickly as we can. But we had a couple of industrious folks who uh, sent us questions via email, uh, sent email, emailed questions directly to me. Um, earlier today. So we're going to go ahead and answer those questions first. Then we'll turn Dr. Mensa and, and Sammy Luce to talk about some things specifically related to our older population and boosting immune health and some other things as well, I'm sure. And then again, we'll take your questions as you have them, type them in, and, and we'll make sure that we get to them before we sign off at the end of the day today. So uh, Dr. Mensa, Sammy, thank you so much for joining us again today, and let's jump into those questions. Um, and one of the questions, uh, and I think it stems both from a combination of the the um, the, com the conversations that you were that you've been having over these last three episodes, speaking to the importance of having fresh fruits and vegetables and, and bringing fresh, th fresh things and non-processed things into the home to eat. And one of our viewers has asked us um, about how safe it is to bring those fresh fruits and fresh vegetables into the house. Is there a possibility that those items might have been contaminated uh, while at the supermarket and then you're bringing that home and eating it? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And the research so far and what we're hearing and seeing out there within the medical community is that there's an extremely low risk, especially with prepared foods. Now, I know this is a question with regard to fresh fruits and vegetables, produce that you're getting at the store yourself, and then bringing home and preparing in your own kitchen. Um, uh, I think that the, the risk is very low, but the best way that you can protect yourself is to take the, you know, whether it's a, a bag of oranges or apples or what have you, is to immediately put them in a bowl for rinsing. You can put some baking soda in there. You can do that with your polyphenol rich berries, your strawberries, your raspberries, things like that. Um, I know we're kind of out of season here, but there's a lot of things that are, uh, that I am seeing in the store here in California that, that are fresh in the berry category. So just making sure that you wash them really well. Um, you can use baking soda, you don't have to, but it's that, it's that vigorous washing that you do that is most protective. Just like we do with our hands, you know, we wash our hands really well. Um, that vigorous washing is what helps uh, along with, with soap and obviously uh, warm, uh, warmer water. Um, that mechanism is what helps to kill the virus and to protect us. So I encourage you to do the same thing with your fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, you can, you know, again, if they're in like one of those, um, uh, you know, bags and you're getting multiples of things, just snip that open, dump it into a large bowl or in the sink and fill that sink up and then make sure that you dispose of that container that it was in uh, promptly you know, wash your hands, and then you can go about washing your produce and then preparing it for, for your meal. So I hope that's helpful. Dr. Mensa, anything to add? Uh, ditto. <laughs> Samantha said it best. She said it just perfectly well. 
Very good, very good. And there was another question to that as well. I didn't, I, I'm sorry, can you refresh my memory there? There was another part to that, I think. Um, not necessarily to that question, but the other question that we got from viewers actually is kind of in the same vein, speaking specifically about um, eating a healthier, more whole food based diet. Uh, and this particular uh, viewer uh, mentioned the fact that, you know, he very, after watching our first three webinars, he made an abrupt transition away from inappropriate foods and from processed foods. And now he's eating a lot more whole foods, a lot more healthy foods, but says that for the first few days at least, um, he actually felt worse instead of better, that, you know, kind of a shock to the system maybe. Uh, and he wanted to know if his results were common, uh, if uh, you can expect that when you make that kind of a change in diet, even though you're moving to foods that are more nutrient rich, uh, if it's going to impact the way you feel maybe in a negative way first. Absolutely. And before I get into what a healing crisis is, and Dr. Mensa, I'd like you to chime in as well with regard to the detox process. I want to say I am really proud of you for taking our advice and for making these changes. That is awesome. Uh, you know, there's the saying that goes, um, just showing up and putting forth that effort is most of the battle. So not only have you shown up, but you put one foot in front of the other. You said, I'm gonna make these changes. I'm listening. I'm going to the store and I'm gonna do this. So again, I just wanna say I'm really proud of you. I hope you're watching uh, because I really want you to know that. Um, yes, a healing crisis was often what I like to term this. It's also called detox, if you will. Um, when your body is used to processed foods, pathways are all jacked up. I kind of give an analogy if you've ever been to LA and you've been on the I-405, which I've had the unfortunate <laughs> displeasure of having to do many times. I don't, I don't, I don't live in Southern California, but it's just, uh, you know, there's lots of accidents. There's lots, lots of detours, um, blocked, um, you know, off ramps, you know, lots of crazy, you know, angry drivers, things going on. And if you think of your body in that sense, like this, this I-405, that um, you know needs some help with the flow. Um, that's what's happening. Your body is upgrading, up leveling. You're giving it new software with all these wonderful fresh foods, all of the wonderful antioxidants, polyphenols, etc., in these foods, and pushing that out and straightening up those pathways, opening them up. I should say, um, uh, you know, straightening out. I guess that's an okay analogy as well. But opening them up is gonna feel uncomfortable. And that detox or healing crisis mechanism that occurs is very normal, it's very common. So I just wanna encourage you, I don't want you to think, oh no, I've made these changes now, what if I have the virus because I'm feeling sick and I'm, I don't have any energy and this is all perfectly normal. I Trust me, I get these emails all the time from my clients, very, very normal. Um, uh, and I just wanna encourage you to continue because the healing crisis, crisis excuse me, will um uh you know will go away and then you'll start to feel better you will start to have more energy you will sleep better and all those wonderful anti-aging effects that we enjoy as humans are also going to start to occur for you so dr mensa what would you like to add Whew. let me tell you i hear you brother i am uh <laughs> my team when we go on outreaches can tell you about some foods i am not allowed to have <laughs> because it is not pretty, okay? Junk food, junkie, here I am. That was my past. It still tries to creep into my present. And every now and then, oh, Twinkies, my favorites from childhood. No, I don't do it. I do my best. But you know that age-old thing? You've heard me talk about pizza, but let's talk about burgers. I mean, come on. This is America. A burger? Are you kidding me? Of course. But then leading that life and then you, you you hit the brakes on it which at some point in time you have to do and then your body goes what on earth are you doing didn't i tell you i want no i said the double cheeseburger with fries because it's at our favorite french fry place and I you better look forward to that okay <laughs> or shake even better no a malt 
If you're real, yes, you a malt. Oh yeah, a malt. malt. Okay. <laughs> so what have you done? I've talked about production of alcohol because you take um, bread or carbs, sugar, add water, and then yeast, and you're you're fermenting. Now, basically, what's really triggering you is the yeast buildup that you've had in your system and the yeast dying off. They're having a fit because you're taking off, you're killing their food source and they want you to engage as much as possible in, in doing that. So they make your life miserable, absolutely miserable. And you turn around and do your family and friends the same favor, okay? Everyone becomes miserable. So it is transitory. Samantha is absolutely right. You feel horrible for a while and then things level off. And then you get to a point where you're now very philosophical, excuse me, very philosophical. Why did I ever have that sandwich in the first place? What is a french fry? Pardon me, Coca-Cola? Nothing but nonsense. I shan't do that again until the next time you do it, right? But things level off, they get better. It's simply an adjustment process. And a lot of people, including yours truly, has been through that, okay? And well, I have now, too. Now that you've made me extremely hungry <laughs> and and i'll have to resist the uh temptation to order a pizza tonight um <laughs> uh i do have one follow-up question that came in right away that was specific to our first question about washing vegetables and the like and and uh this viewer is saying that uh even before covid um they always washed their vegetables in a sink with vinegar, um, mm -hmm. but then have come to read and to hear that uh, vinegar, uh, not sure if that really works, that that really kills the COVID virus. But also, as you were just saying, Sam, uh, that the COVID vi virus doesn't, necess ne doesn't necessarily impact the digestive system. So thoughts on that? Will vinegar and water work? Is that a, a, a good way to go? And does the COVID virus impact the digestive tract? Yeah, uh, both of those are good questions. Uh, the first with regard to vinegar, uh, my preference would be the baking soda route. I think that's going to be much more beneficial. That has been shown actually to be more beneficial um, uh, and then, and then again, the vigorous washing, which, you know, as you shared, you're already doing. So that's fantastic. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, I would just encourage switching to, um, uh, the baking soda, uh, with regard to COVID impacting the GI tract, I, you know, I hope I didn't, um, uh, I, I hope I didn't lead you in, you know, in the wrong direction in that sense. It's not so much that it doesn't. It's just that when we're talking about food and specifically prepared foods, the virus doesn't stick like it does with other things like our surfaces, like our cardboard boxes or especially our plastics, our phone, our, our rubber gloves. That's why we need to be really mindful with things like that. So we're really concerned about um, surfaces and of course if we're in contact with people and droplets and things like that um, this virus is going to impact I mean obviously it's respiratory but it's going to impact every body system that we have so it's not that the GI tract is immune it's just food especially prepared foods that you're ordering like takeout um, and so forth those are the, the risk is basically non-existent so I, I hope that makes sense Anything to add, Dr. Mensa? Nope. Okay. I think we should move on to the top today. We've got a lot to talk about. Very good. And, and that's just what I was going to say. So, folks, uh, I encourage you to continue to send your questions in via that Q&A tab. But we're going to, as I said before, we're going to turn Dr. Mensa and, and Ms. Gilbert loose for the next half hour, 40 minutes let them share some stuff that they've been talking about as it relates to our topic du jour, uh, boosting immune health. But, but specifically, as, as I understand it, they wanted to talk a little bit about our elderly population today. So we're going to let them go for about 30, 40 minutes. Get your questions in. And uh, as those questions roll in and as Dr. Mensa and, and Ms. Joubert finish up their conversation, we'll get those questions answered. We will stay a little bit late again 
uh, today if need be to make sure that we get all of your questions answered. So Dr. Mensa, Samantha, take it away. Thank well, you. Sammy, thank you once again for, uh, for, for giving us so much insight into everything and we're looking forward to our conversation today. Everyone out there, one of the major things that I want us to really understand and get straight is that we know the people who seem to be the most susceptible to this condition, uh, to this creature, are those who've got comorbid conditions and the elderly, usually individuals with poor immune function. Um, some disturbing thoughts that come our way is to hear the idea of almost people being expendable. I don't know of too many doctors who don't cringe at the thought of losing any kind of patient whatsoever of any age category. Our loved ones are seniors, our mates are seniors, and if you're old enough, some of our children are seniors, which makes us ultra seniors, okay? My oldest patient is 98 years old and she's got 70 year old kids, okay? So, you know, this is a very important topic because we need to understand, um, what we can do to help protect ourselves and, and these individuals in these categories. Um, when you've got diabetes, hypertension, when you've got lupus, any other kind of condition um, that comes into play, even in middle age, that can be a problem as well. How many times have we heard about individuals who are 48, 50, not 48, we don't consider middle age, I don't, but in their 50s or their 60s, and they contract this virus and you know they don't make it. Very, very disturbing. The reason we're doing this series is because we've heard so much in the media about, well, when the vaccine comes out. Then the next thing we hear about is about how we don't have enough beds. Then we hear about we don't have enough ventilators. Oh, what is all this doing? This is all about a transition to a negative outcome. Even in Chicago, I just heard this morning, well, we've got a new facility that's going to allow for the, um, the support of 1,500 more dead bodies. And I said, my goodness, what are you saying here? I mean, is this what we're focusing on? How about being proactive? And Sammy, uh, yesterday we were talking and you used a very great uh, term here and a great idea about how we really need to put home first. Sammy, what was it you were saying? Why don't you, you go ahead and jump in here? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mensa. I, I, I really want to encourage everyone in this last episode of this series, and this is why Dr. Mensa and, and I are more than happy to stay as you know long, long as we, we need because we want to support you. Um, because what we're seeing and, and how this is progressing, I really, really, really want to encourage you to think of your kitchen as your hospital, food as your medicine. Um, yes. We're particularly concerned about how this is going to halt and, and, and you know, obviously our, our, our hospital systems are gonna break down as a result of this virus. There, things are already happening in that vein, but we're particularly concerned with the elderly, again, people with uh, comorbidity and, you know, people with, with cancer, diabetes, hypertension, um, people that are on dialysis, we're just really concerned about, you know, what's, what's going to happen if we don't start making these in-home, in-hospital home changes right now. We're going to continue, we're already seeing this, by the way, we're going to continue to see an increase in insulin sensitivity because people are not being active. People are eating the canned foods, which are super high in uh, sodium. So mm -hmm. hypertension, you know, these things are going to continue to increase, but you have of the power please don't let the media sway you to sit around and you know wait for a vaccine um, I'm not saying that you're doing that but I think this is a great time to use fear as a mobilizer and to get us thinking about when we go to the store and we have our protective gear on we have that mask that's on that's that's placed perfectly on our faces um, when we go into the store that we're making good choices that we're going to the produce area which is fully stocked, by the way. I was just at the store the other day. The produce area is still stocked. There isn't a shortage of food, so I really wanna make that clear. We have a very good food supply right now. Um, you know, Things might be out of stock because people have been hoarding like the toilet paper, but really want to uh, encourage you and to think about you are your hospital, you are your own caretaker, and you have that power. Um, Dr. Dr. Menso, would you like to, to add to that? Yeah, you know, 
this whole idea, thank you, Sammy, and to build on that, the idea here is, look, even when you're sick and you're only so sick and you call the hospital, they tell you, you're not bad enough, don't come in. What does that mean? It means your home is now your hospital. You are in charge of your own resources to get better. So we were intentionally going in this direction because we want to help you help yourself. Okay. So now we've got to create our own community, our own family with information so that if this happens, or if you know someone this happens to, you can give them some salient advice and some good pieces to work with. So Sammy and I together, we're gonna to be talking about foods, and we're gonna be talking about nutrient supplements. We're gonna be talking about some interesting things as well, such as some dietary foodstuffs that contain really powerful sources of certain types of chemicals that can help you do much better. Something that I'm gonna give you a little bit of insight to, what they have not talked about yet, it's the fact that this particular virus is not simply a respiratory virus. It has effects on the blood, the vasculature, and coagulation. In other words, the formation of blood clots. And then it creates this huge storm of release of chemicals called cytokines that are inflammatory pieces that will eventually lead to what most people hear of, somebody being on a ventilator in a hospital. So, part of what we want to talk about are some of the things that we can do to help decrease those potential threats, okay? Decrease those potential reactions and so forth. And the better armed we are to go into battle, the better we're going to do, the better the outcome. So mm -hmm. that's where we're going today. Now, before I get into that, I'm going to make it very clear. I'm putting it out there. Most of our patients, most people we've talked to and so forth, you're on a nutrient program, you've got high antioxidants, you know, you're eating well, you're doing for the most part okay. Doesn't mean you won't get anything, it just means that for the most part, you've got a lot going on to help you weather that storm. For other folks, you know, we're kind of talking to you too. Right now, as far as we're concerned, outside of a bleeding disorder or anything else along those lines, everyone should be on a solid dosage of vitamin C. We're talking at least three to 4,000, sometimes 5,000 international units or milligrams, depending on whatever you get, of vitamin C per day. Okay, we're talking about zinc, zinc picolinate, that's one we like, okay, picolinate. We're talking about at least 80 milligrams of zinc picolinate to 100 milligrams for the next three months. Now, just the next three months, okay, even without testing. We're talking about vitamin D, at least 10,000 international units per day to 20,000. These are adult dosages, okay? These are things we consider absolutely key and later on, we'll share with you why. It's not just about the immune side of things. It's also about how do we help stop blood clots and thrombus formation and platelets sticking together, okay? That's where we're going today. Sammy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Menso. One thing I wanted to add on to that uh, cytokine uh, storm um, you know, I've been I've gotten this question a lot. There's a lot of information out there about different types of herbal formulations like elderberry and echinacea, and people are very worried, oh, should I take this? I'm reading this, I'm reading that, I'm reading this. Same thing with vitamin D. Um, and that's that's not the issue here. Now, of course, if you're taking high doses of elderberry, you know, that might be, you know, might want to rethink super high doses, but the whole point is that these things happen on their own as a result of stress, fight, flight, freeze. That's gonna create a storm right there. So the best thing you can do is to, and I know it's not easy right now to be calm, but whatever you can do, whether it's meditation or prayer, I like to pray, um, uh, you know, anything you can do to get quiet. I kind of shared um, some other techniques previously. I shared a breathing technique that works very, very quickly to trick your nervous system into relaxation. So we're talking about sympathetic to parasympathetic, we're all in fight, fright, fight, flight, freeze right now. Um, and that, again, is creating that storm. So the very best thing you can do is to take your time and load up on these nutrient-rich foods that we're talking about that we're going to discuss today. Um, and that's, you know, that, that's really, um, again, allowing your medicine to be your food and your home, your kitchen is, is, is your hospital area. Um, you know what, Sammy, one thing I want to add to that, um, I remember back at a certain point in time in, la in life when a colleague of mine and I would 
uh, sit with a few other guys in our dorm room, and we would listen to, back in those days, tapes, audio tapes of comedians. And we would sit there and laugh our heads off, right, Mr. Wells? And uh, we would listen to the Robin Williams and the, the Eddie Murphys at the time. And laughter is powerful medicine. Yes. You know, we sit down, we're watching Netflix, and we're trying to figure out what good movie to watch. Listen, we need to be watching 24 hours a day, if possible, the comedians, the good ones. OK, not the offensive ones. Mm -hmm. uh, laughter is a powerful, powerful tool. It raises all the good hormones in your system. In addition to, you know, wonderful, the meditation, we can't OD on anything when we're in the house all the time. Okay? We just can't. But we can now juxtapose periods of meditation, periods of laughter, periods of relaxation, periods of work. And that balance helps to decrease the stress. Okay? So I just wanted to talk about laughter. It's huge medicine. It is. I'm so glad you said that, Dr. Mensa. And and along the same lines, uh, you know, please, 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 I implore you, turn off notifications on your phone. Every mm -hmm. time you get a notification from Apple News about what a leader says or what a government official says or, you, you know, someone's posting another article and they contradict each other, just turn it off. I'm not saying not be informed. I think it's important that we be informed. I think it's important that we check things periodically. But if you've got notifications on your phone, well, guess what? You're in fight, flight, freeze, always worrying about ding, ding, ding. Oh my gosh, another, you know, uh, another estimate, another percentage, another, another this, another that. And it's just going to turn you, it's going to turn things into a tailspin. So, so, so just remember your, your brain, and Dr. Mansa said this, I think a couple of episodes ago, your brain does not know the difference between the tiger chasing you and what you're reading on the news. It's going to respond the same. That stress response is going to be the same. That cytokine storm is going to be the same, regardless of whether you're running away from the tiger or not. So these are also things that you can do while you're home, and especially with kids. I see a lot of children um, three years old on iPhones um, all the time. And I get that it's a way to keep your child distracted, but it's also changing their brain. So I, just, I also want to just encourage you parents out there to think about screen times um, and letting your kids be on, on your phone or an iPad for most of the day. Um, and, you know, get in the kitchen again, get into your hospital, start making your medicine together and take your time eating, breathe, chew your food. All of these things are going to help um, with that stress response. So just wanted to throw that in there. Dr. Mensa, would you like to move on to, um, I mean, we were talking about blood clots and we were, you know, foods and so forth. Do you want to kind of shift into that area? Is there something else you wanted to share? Yeah. This is, this is really significant because um, these pieces are, are areas where we don't hear too much conversation about them, okay? And so our conversation today is going to be about what are foods that kind of help to decrease platelet adhesion. When platelets come together, that's the beginning of trouble, right? And they're sticky. Mm -hmm. um, what are foods that are good for your blood? What are foods that you know, are going to be beneficial to keeping your system alive? We talk about the, the Mediterranean diet, for example, as being a, uh, and it's very well known to be a wonderful longevity promoting um, creature, but many people don't realize that in that diet, there are, many, um, there are many substances that stop blood from getting thick, that, that keep the, the flow moving very, very nicely. And yes, I understand some of you are saying, well, listen, my child has autism or I have this. We're not talking about the exceptions. Right now we're just talking about, you know, the, the overall situation here and not what is going to be prototypically um, for everyone. We'll address the individual circumstances with questions, okay? But, you know, let's take some lessons from individuals, countries, regions where there's longevity, where the incidence of stroke, heart attack, um, embolisms are low. And let's ask the question why. And that's why we've got this young lady here with us today. That's where we're going. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mensa. Um, and I'll just start off by, you know, <laughs> there's a couple of herbs that I love that are high in vitamin C, wonderful for purifying the blood, and used, um, you know, quite commonly in these regions. And one of them is parsley. 
You can add it. Um, I don't recommend cooking with it. It's going to be better in its raw state, but you can use it as a finishing herb. You can use it in salads. Um, it's, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful herb to work with. The other one is cilantro. Um, I'm kind of a cilantro fiend. I, I, I love it so much to kind of put it in everything. So those are two things that you can start cooking with. They are at the store. I, you know, I saw both of them at the store a couple of days ago. Um, cayenne, if we're gonna get into this area, we have to talk about salicylates, we have, which, which aspirin is a, is a, a derivative of salicylate, uh, salicylic, excuse me, um, acid. Um, so we need to start talking about things like cayenne, things that help lower blood pressure, things that improve circulation. I've already mentioned, um, uh, uh, ginger and turmeric and garlic. These are all wonderful things to be cooking with. They taste good. They're good for your digestion. Garlic helps kill uh, things off in the GI tract. Um, and it's just, I, I don't know about you, but I love garlic and I don't, I don't mind the smell because I, I enjoy it so much and I know how therapeutic it is. Um, uh, cassia cinnamon is a, a really unique form of of cinnamon that also has the same properties. I've got some really great muffin recipes on my uh, website. And you can just, you know, throw a couple teaspoons or, or more in, in those recipes. You can add uh, the cinnamon to smoothies. Um, you can make ice cream with it. I have a banana, a frozen banana ice cream recipe on my uh, website, eatboard.life, and then just click on journal. And then you can scroll down and see that recipe. It's so easy to make. It's basically bananas, coconut milk, and cinnamon, uh, and some stevia if you want it a little bit sweeter. I find that the bananas are sweet enough. But um, it, this this particular form of cinnamon um, contains uh, coumarin, which is a, a powerful blood thinning agent. Uh, warfarin is is made from this, and um, I have found it to be very beneficial for my senior patients. Um, and, and, you know, who doesn't love cinnamon? So those are th some things that you can start uh, cooking with and working with. Um, if, if, you know, if we're going to get into polyphenols again, we kind of had that discussion before, but, you know, your berries, your blueberries, your blackberries, your raspberries, your strawberries. Um, I mentioned flaxseed. I'm a big fan of flaxseed meal. That is considered also a polyphenol. Make sure you refrigerate it. You can go rancid very quickly. Um, the flax crackers, unless they're, they're cooked, um, the flax crackers, um, I've mentioned those as a great snack. Kids love them. They're very, very high in fiber, and fiber is also an important component of uh, the Mediterranean diet. And, and just in general, when we're looking at vascular disease, when we're looking at hypertension, things like this, we want to make sure that you're getting you know, the rainbow of vegetables, and uh, you know, getting getting a lot of good fibers that way. Um, I've already mentioned turmeric, uh, clove, uh, green tea is in that category. Chicory, mm -hmm. artichokes, red onions. <laughs> um, all of these things are wonderful polyphenols, which basically means that they have high antioxidant activity. They're wonderful to cook with. They're wonderful to use in recipes, and they're extremely medicinal. Um, Dr. Mensa, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? So, you know, we're, we're talking about the, the great dietary pieces here. And of course, there's some undermethylated person out there who's asking the question, well, wait a minute, exactly how does this work? So let's talk about polyphenols actually have been researched. There's a lot of research out there with regard to exactly how these things work. And they are indeed antiplatelet adhesion molecules. They're not just antioxidants. Believe me, the, the system, the natural system that has been put here for us and you know remember me i was the skeptical guy uh way back when all this earth stuff you know whatever i'm a doctor i deal in medicine and drugs you know and research and blah 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 blah. you know what it's all been laid out here for us we've had to find it even our drugs come from natural elements from dandelion from the elderberries from the tubers that are out there all those things are there and they are healing and we now understand the molecular nature therein so I've had to eat humble dirt, so to speak, with all the folks that I made fun of over the course of my life, including members of my own family, okay, with regard to the position I now take. Because it's not simply something about, oh, that herb is good for you, but I don't know how it works. No, we know the exact molecular nature. Polyphenols 
have a tremendous capacity to stop and decrease, to say the least, um, platelet aggregation, coagulation properties, et cetera. Now I sit down and I've got to talk about something that typically I usually say against because we talk about undermethylation and overmethylation. And everyone's heard me say, well, you know, if you're undermethylated and eating things like kale and, you know, large quantities of folic acid rich stuff is just not going to work well for you cognitively and blah, 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 blah. Well, you know what? Guess what those kinds of foods are really good for right now? Exactly what we're talking about. So these properties for immune health and dealing with platelet aggregation and anticoagulation, guess what? Kale is one of your best friends, okay? Mm -hmm. Guess what? The folate-rich foods are some of your best friends. So now you're thinking, well, wait a minute. If I'm undermethylated, how can I eat those things? Because if I've got anxiety, depression, or schizophrenia, or bipolar, or whatever, when I get worse? Well, a couple of things. First of all, we're talking about a short range of time. Namely, we're talking about a few months here until we get over this hump. And if you're taking your nutrient programs, you should at least stay neutral, okay, with regard to that dietary piece, okay? If you're not, give us a call. But one of the key things here is that if we're not around and healthy physically, our cognition is not going to be an issue. Our mental health isn't going to be an issue if we're on a ventilator, Yeah. okay? Not in the conscious sense. So here's the time where we sit down and we say, irrespective of your biochemistry, maybe outside of copper toxicity, but if it's about methylation, listen, you still need to tend to these foods, those wonderful dark green leafy vegetables, okay, that for most of the population, I would say otherwise is a problem. They're now your best friends, okay? Not just them, but a variety of other foodstuffs that, yeah, you know, yeah, it's high in copper, but if you're not high in copper, go eat it. Okay, you know, these things are all there for us. And we now have to pay attention to broadening the scope of our diet because big time on the list is eating foods rich in antioxidants, um, rich in polyphenols, rich in flavonoids. And some, someone out there just said, oh, flavonoids, wine, red wine. Ha, honey, guess what? I just got the okay to drink wine. Bring on that thing. You know, we know what you guys are doing because the liquor stores are basically flooded with orders. They are running out. It's taking longer to deliver. That is not what we're talking about. Yes. A glass or two of red wine, beneficial flavonoids. We're not talking about liters here, people. Okay. We're not talking about we're bored, so all we're going to do is drink. That creates inflammation in our systems. Okay. So we want to be careful. We now understand there are many elements that are antioxidant rich that are supportive of your blood flow, that minimize um, coagulative properties, that decrease incidence of strokes, um, extra, extra virgin olive oil, Sammy, that, that's your, your situation there. Um, all these things are there, but we must be wise and judicious about what we do and how we do it. Mm -hmm. Some things to excess can be a problem as well. Absolutely. But this is what we're paying attention, attention, attention to right now. So Sammy, we just talked about what are some of your other fav favorite polyphenols that are vegetable rich in origin? Um, gosh, um, you know, I think I mentioned things like, <laughs> this is going to be a weird one for people. Um, it's one that I recommend a lot. And I know we're going to get into the conversation of low stomach acid, especially as we get older and in the elderly. But um, umabashi plum is from <laughs> Japan. Uh, very, very rich, excellent also for digestion, excellent for increasing stomach acid, excellent also for getting the saliva juices, those amylases in our mouth, um, secreting so that when we take that first bite of food, that digestive process um, is, is impacted on a greater level, especially if our, uh, our, our enzymes are low. Um, so I love umabashi plum. You can get it at Asian markets. I've seen it at Whole Foods. Um, you can also get the vinegar. That will definitely be at most, I, I would say, health food stores, especially in the Asian section, or probably even, uh, you know, kind of your, your regular conventional, I guess, supermarkets. And you can make a dressing out of that. You can add a little bit of acid to, you know, I mentioned I do bowls. I just throw vegetables in a bowl. Um, I'll add an acid, uh, I'll add, you know, a sauce, um, a little bit of unrefined salt and mix it all up and 
you know, that's my, my lunch and my dinner because it's quick and it's easy and it tastes good. Um, you know, you can just, you know, use these things. Now, acids, what do they do? Every culture has an acid. They help break things down. I mentioned that previously, but they also aid in digestion. So that's why in Italy, you pair tomato sauce with beef um, because the acid is going to make that beef more digestible. Um, you know, in our, in our beautiful South American countries, we have things like lime. Um, and they also use a lot of cilantro, by the way. Why do they use cilantro? You know, I kind of already went down that road. Um, but, you know, I wanted to say also with regard to the, the wine and, um, you know, I, I, I'm not against drinking. I'm not a big drinker myself. I totally agree with Dr. Mensa. Um, but I do want to encourage people, especially if you already have um, like a GI issue, if you already have some kind of, um, you know, lowered immunity, that right now drinking alcohol, probably not the best idea. Um, and I, I'm encouraging, I've encouraged a couple of people that I work with to, to actually not drink right now because of their circumstances. So of course, everyone is different. You figure that out for yourself. Dr. Mensa has great guidance, but I just want to caution being careful the thing about uh, wine is that they're adding commercial yeast. Believe it or not, they add colors to the wine to make it more sure. beautiful looking, um, uh, which is crazy because, well, I'm not gonna get into that, but there are a lot of things that are added to wine that they're not obligated by law to tell you about. Uh, so I just, you know, again, unless you're getting a biodynamic wine, um, you know, from, Italy or somewhere, uh, you know, I, I would be really mindful there. Um, so, yeah, sorry, for, go ahead, Dr. Mensa. No, so thank you for bringing that up. That's very important. Um, I've got a little tidbit for men out there. Uh, if you're married or you've got a girlfriend or a significant other, um, it's really a good time to go and, and take the advice of Forrest Gump. Go order yourself a box of dark chocolates and present it to that significant other in your life. You know why? Because you can say, <laughs> I got you some medicine. I, I heard this dude talking online and you know, dark chocolates are rich in polyphenols. They are. <laughs> so here's something where, and you know normally this guy tells you, no, they're high in copper, they're this, they're this and this and this, not a good idea. And the face is just a little kind of frowning. Well, for the next three, four months to say the least, guess what? I'm not saying OD on the stuff, but here's a great chance to say, you know, your husband says, honey, I thought you weren't going to eat chocolate. You're saying, I'm, I'm having medicine right now. And it's very tasty. Give me my, my time. I need my moment. Okay. <laughs> Beautiful. There's a blessing for you. Dark chocolate right now is actually a good idea. Okay. I just wanted to throw that one in there, Sam. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. Yes, I had that, uh, I had that in my mind as well. Um, clove. Clove is, is another wonderful polyphenol. You can add it to your recipes, your muffin recipes. You can add it to your tea. Um, all of those are wonderful right now. I think teas are a really great way to go because they have, you know, they give you kind of a nice uh, one-two punch. Um, with regard to chocolate, I would encourage you to get chocolate that's sweetened with like coconut palm sugar. Um, Hue, that company I mentioned previously that makes those crackers that I'm kind of obsessed with right now, um, they use totally clean ingredients. The company's just called HU. They're out of New York City. But their chocolate is now being sold um, in many places now, uh, definitely in a couple of stores uh, area here in Central California. So um, I, I, I do encourage going that route. Um, and yes, like Dr. Mensa said, getting the dark chocolate. Um, we're not advocating Hershey's bars here. We're not advocating Hershey's Kisses and Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. We're advocating the healthier options that are made with good sweeteners that aren't going to create inflammation in your body and trigger off an immune response. So I, I kind of wanted to make that um, little notation there as well. No, absolutely, absolutely true. We're looking at the, the, the elements that are made from cocoa. It's the cocoa that has the polyphenol capacity. That's what we're really talking about. And Wonderful. the higher the percentage, you know, the more, you know, the more antioxidant uh, protection that that it has. Uh, I know we're starting to get bitter after 75%, but you're going to get more bang for your buck if you're willing to go with a higher percentage. All right, Sammy, let's move on to the next topic that we wanted to kind of share with everyone. 
Yeah, I kind of wanted to, um, you know, we had had this discussion a couple of times. We talked about this master mineral that we love so much that's our favorite mineral um, the last couple of episodes. And, you know, Dr. Mensa, I'd really like to revisit that, especially as it pertains to the elderly. We know that zinc uh, dramatically decreases as we get older. And another side effect of that is, of course, lowered stomach acid, which is a um, which is a chronic health problem in the elderly. And that's another thing that is leading to malnutrition in the elderly. And then of course, lack of taste for foods, lack of appetite, um, because zinc is needed to you know, give us that taste. Um, so I kind of want to go in that direction. Dr. Mensa, do you want to kind of start us off, kind of give us a little refresher on zinc again and why it's important, especially for um, our, our older population? Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's very interesting how we perceive our seniors. You know, we see them as slowing down in life. We see them as oftentimes just not very with it. Um, I'm going to give you a story that's actually true. So I was uh, working in a small town at one point in time, and um, I was taking care of the the uh, the aunt of an individual, and the idea was that she had dementia. And I said, okay, so fine, we're going to put her on our uh, Alzheimer's uh, prevention protocol, actually our Alzheimer's treatment protocol. And in doing so, what we, we really do is we sort of prime everyone with zinc and vitamin B6. Well, one of the things that happens is that because our seniors aren't eating, they're not really ingesting, they're really deficient, they're really deficient in zinc. Zinc and B6 are necessary to make neurotransmitters. So serotonin, dopamine, calming neurotransmitters like GABA, if you don't have them, you don't function, you become seemingly depressed. Well, I got a phone call three weeks after starting this patient on just the zinc and the vitamin B6 alone. And we got a very odd reaction because the, the patient's um, niece called and said, what did you do to my aunt? And I said, what do you mean? She said, she used to just sit there. Now she won't shut up. She keeps talking and talking, and she wants to go to the mall. She's getting her hair done. She's getting her nails done, and I've got to take her to all these places. What did you do? And I said, I gave her basically some neurotransmitter activity again. <laughs> we were mistaking the lack of nutrient capacity with cognitive dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And she was dysfunctioning because she didn't have the basic elements necessary for her cognitive health. Now, that's one block, that's one area over here. But when we take that and we start to look at what it's doing to the system, without zinc, your immunity goes down. So you're more subject to colds, flus, illness in general. That's one of the reasons why being an elderly, so to speak, is a risk factor for immune compromise and illness and severe illness and even death. Um, gastric acid production, absolutely. But here's the thing too, something very simple. If you don't have zinc, guess what? Your taste buds don't work very well. So now you're zinc depleted, your taste buds don't work well. It doesn't matter to you if you have a steak or if you have a peanut butter sandwich. So what do you care? You're gonna bother eating? No, your appetite now goes down. Foods don't smell very good, so do you really care what's being cooked? You know, you'll eat at four o'clock like everybody else and you won't care. I mean, there's a huge domino effect that happens here. So correcting the domino effect or shifting it even with just decent levels, first you got to be tested, okay, then you get treated. But changing that one piece changes the entire spectrum of life, everything from ingestion of foodstuffs. As Samantha said, it begins in the brain. Anticipation of food starts our entire salivary process starting moving, starts the GI tract, is preparing everything. And if those triggers aren't happening, it becomes harder to digest in the processed foods, okay? And then of course, no food, no absorption, no absorption, no immunity, no immunity, illness. To make it very, very simple with just one or two examples. So there's real, real consequence to being deficient in certain nutrients, certain master nutrients as Sammy so well put it. Sammy? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mensa. And I, you know, this just, it, this kind of reminds me of my dad. My dad passed away not long ago and, and I did test his zinc level because I was noticing pretty a fairly rapid decline. He was becoming quite frail, 
and um, sleep was non-existent. He was belching all the time. He didn't have an appetite. And his zinc was non-existent when I tested him, and I knew he didn't have any stomach acid because zinc is needed to create stomach acid. But what people forget and fail to remember is a lot of the medications that our seniors are on, like H2 blockers, um, PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, they all decrease stomach acid and they just exacerbate this immune flare because stomach acid, as we've already shared, is needed to kill off the critters. Stomach acid kills parasites, um, bacteria, and so forth that comes in through our mouth and our, uh, you know, on our food. And it, this beautiful design that is our human bodies was created to help kill those things off once it hits that acidic stomach. And well, guess what? If you don't have any stomach acid or it's extremely low, then the healthiest diet in the world is going to be, you know, not as effective. And that's saying it nicely um, because you're not absorbing. Um, so we kind of have this, you know, this cycle of taking these medications that uh, impair GI capacity and function. And then we, you know, add insult to injury with, you know, very low levels of nutrients. So that's something else I wanted to make sure that was clear. And I loved how Dr. Mensa put this. It's not that, oh, this is, this is just getting older, deal with it. I don't agree with that. Dr. Mensa doesn't agree with that. The way that people are aging, especially in this country, is not normal. What's happening is nutrient levels are just terribly low. And of course, that's going to impact the brain. It's going to impact the gut. It's going to impact our capacity to be, um, to have good energy, to sleep well at night, to be happy, to be joyful, all of those wonderful things that we associate with this human experience. And, you know, I, I, I sure loved my dad, uh, but he, he wouldn't listen to me. And I wanted to help him. And I'd say, here, I can help you. Let's try some of these things. And, um, you know, you know, that saying uh, a prophet isn't really well received in his hometown. So <laughs> um, God bless him. But I just sharing a story. And I, I don't want you. I, I don't I don't want that for you. I, I, I want to encourage you today, Dr. Mensa and I both want to encourage you today to think about uh, and this whole series has been about the power of nutrients, the capacity of what you're eating. Again, your kitchen needs to be your hospital, not just now, but moving forward. Your medicines are your foods that you're bringing home. Um, and then of course the nutrients that you're taking on top of that. But this is all um, so powerful, especially for the senior population. So um, I hope that, well, I hope that makes sense. Um, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mensa, did you want to, Yeah. Any, there, anything there, else you there. wanna add to that? A couple of points there that are very interesting. Let's talk about the stereotypical senior, right? There are plenty of medications. Oh, I'm on this medication for my blood pressure. I'm on this medication for my cholesterol. I'm on this medication because, you know, my homocysteine level is high. Um, I'm on this medication for da 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 da. And, you know, I was having a, a conversation with my uh, colleague, Dr. Bowman, today. I said, you know what? What the blue blazes is wrong with us in medicine? The smarter we get, the dumber we become. Since when is hypertension a diagnosis? Hypertension is a symptom. It is a symptom of something wrong in the system. Yes. Last time we talked about cholesterol being high, being a symptom of something wrong in the system. And the liver is putting cholesterol out there to try to cleanse itself and the rest of the system. And we are taking medication to decrease that instead of trying to find out what the underlying causes are. And the same with hypertension. So what are we doing? You know, for the most part, it's medication because we figure, well, no one's gonna change their lifestyle habits anyway. So, you know, why just not let it ride? Well, the hypertension is telling you something is wrong. Investigate, is this a kidney issue? Is this a, you know, a, 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 an outside renal issue? Is this an issue with, with your endocrine system? Why is this happening, okay? Something very simple. Is this person acidic? Or are they basic? Or are they neutral in their pH? You know where illness begins? Sammy, tell them where illness begins. Thank you, Sammy. When you're acidic. Just teasing, Sammy, right? But when you're acidic, that's where illness thrives. You've got to get your pH balance back to something that's alkaline. 
We're not talking about your stomach, we're talking about the rest of the system. Your cells can't thrive in an acidic environment, okay? So people say, well, that's why I tried detoxing. But Dr. Mensa, I've heard you talk about detoxing. And you said, well, that's pretty you know, neutral. I said, well, wait a minute. It depends on what you're talking about as the original condition. When we're talking about mental health, bipolar, schizophrenia, ADHD, you know, those are different situations outside of when you're talking about something that's, say, a physical challenge or problem. Okay? The liver has got to be a, a clean, functioning organism. Your pancreas has to be clean and functioning. All these irregularities are signs saying, hello, your glucose is high because you're either stressed or there's a problem with your pancreas. But why is there a problem with your pancreas? And why is there a problem with your thyroid gland? And instead of what we've done in medicine is we fractionated everything into small miniature diagnoses. And virtually every single one of those is a symptom of something else underlying that's problematic. And the right foods, change in habits, all those types of things, um, with some scientific understanding and organization, can actually change lives tremendously. Mm -hmm. I was watching a, a program on TV earlier this morning, and I just sat back and said, okay, I, I've got more than enough evidence here. I can't deny this anymore. Really, food is nutrition. Food is, is really medicine. Um, thank you, Sammy. Um, it's, it's one where we have to say, you know, a lot of disorders have been cured by esoteric folks who we've never heard of, who've got backgrounds, and yet what they did was strictly working on correcting the actual imbalances in the system. Mm -hmm. Some of them didn't use nutrients. Many of them were using foods, and many of you have heard of them out there but it's the scientific process in approaching. You just can't willy-nilly take this or this and this. Anyway, without me getting too hyper verbose, the, the idea here is that sickness begins and sits oftentimes with just the balance within the body of acidity and basicity, okay? The more acidic you are, the more illness is gonna thrive. The more mucus production happens when you, when you now encounter these other mechanisms, okay? So there are a lot of things that we have to do and even as you're trying to move in that process, let's ask a very simple question. You take Sammy's wonderful advice. You eat all those wonderful foods, but as we talked about, I think in episode two, your GI tract is messed up, okay? You've got leaky gut, you're inflamed, you've got all these things going on. And let's, let's talk to that gentleman who was like me, the junk food guy. You did that to yourself. We're not talking about Crohn's or ulcerative colitis or or something that no one has control over that's a genetic phenomenon. We inflame our GI tract all the time. And we're wondering why we don't function too terribly well, why I'm spacey, my brain is foggy, I am anxious, I'm depressed. Listen, I was a medical student in my first year eating nothing other than burgers and fries for lunch, going to dinner at McDonald's, then waking up in the morning and having all sorts of fried junk and I could not figure out why my brain was so hard to, to process all this medical information. And then when I started getting fatter, um, it dawned on me, dude, aren't you supposed to be a doctor one day? Um, maybe you should try eating properly. <laughs> so I totally changed everything else around and all of a sudden my brain became clearer, okay? I felt better, I was able to focus and do all those right things. Now, no one is perfect. You know, we slip, we have our ups and downs, but understanding is the key. We're all grabbing these, these medications to try to correct things because we want the instant fix. It is not like that. A gentleman who just passed away, he's an 82-year-old man. Um, I'm not gonna tell you his name because I don't want you Googling this guy, but he said something very interesting and I cracked up because it was something that I had said and he's 30 years older than I am. He said, that we are carbon-based atoms, or uh, carbon-based people. And our systems must work in alignment with similar. Pharmaceutical medications, I admit sometimes we need them, but pharmaceutical medications and all of these other remedies we so-called give in the scientific world are not in alignment with our organic structures.
and hence we get side effects. Hence we get ramifications of, of, of other disease elsewhere. Um, hence the potential toxicities, okay? We have to get back to being in alignment, but in order to do that, you also have to have a functional digestive system. So the, the gentleman who chimed in earlier, thank you so much for taking that first step. Because now when you take Samantha's advice and you start eating all the right elements, your system incorporates it so much better. It actually works to your favor, okay? Sorry I can prep it on, but I had to both confess and then just chastise all of us in medicine here for a moment for forgetting these are not diagnoses. These are symptoms. Symptoms. That we have to now get to the root causes, otherwise we don't undo anything, okay? Now, congratulations. Many of you are already there. Many of you recognize this in the medical world. And many of you folks um, who are listening have found those kind of doctors or practitioners. Good for you. But this is for the rest of us who are sitting there year after year being taught and indoctrinated traditional medical approaches and ways of thinking. Wrong. That's why we don't fix anyone. Not too well, not too often. We may prevent some things, but we also create some difficulties. Okay. Let's get back to food as medicine and learn more about how we can create proper alignment with our carbon-based selves through the natural elements of the world. Remember where pharmaceuticals come from in the first place? Nature. Yeah. Then. Yeah, thank you. That was wonderful. I, the only thing I was going to add to that, and I know, um, you know we want to be able to start answering questions here fairly quickly, but, uh, you know, it's interesting to me, a lot of the dietary advice that comes from the medical mm -hmm. community the Dietetic Association, et cetera. And I'm not, you know, I have friends that are dietitians, so please don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. But if we're talking about seniors, we're talking about hypertension, we're talking about all these symptoms, um, but yet the dietary guidance is often whole grain, whole wheat, um, saturated fats are bad. We know that that's a myth now. Um, you know, focusing on things that are very much industrialized, you know, we call this the industrialized fats, the soy, the corn, the canola oils, um, all of which uh, actually contribute to these conditions that we've been talking about. So, um, and I know most of you already know this, this is a review, but I think there's a lot of people that don't. And we know this because they are our patients. They come to us and they're you know eating at mcdonald's or they're they're cooking with canola oil or soybean oil or you know eating a lot of um uh, cereals dr mensa you mentioned breakfast cereals um and all of these things create what dr mensa you know terms uh, you know yes the acidic environment another term for that is just inflammation we want to make sure that we're not inflaming our bodies we're not making them more acidic in that sense we're not saying that acid foods are bad like tomatoes that's not what dr mensa means merely it's these processed foods that are creating this acidic environment within us um, that's leading to these symptoms that's creating these disease states that are not and i repeat are not a normal part of the aging process so um, i'm off my soapbox now thank you dr mensa um, I'm not sure. Do, do you want to start answering uh, uh, answering questions or? Because um... I'm I'm still halfway on my soapbox. It's unfortunate <laughs> these things where once I start going off on things, it, it just seems to perpetuate itself. Um, but I am going to tone it down. I, I promise. Um, it, it's just so critically important, you know, that we recognize where we go wrong. And you know, I, I get it. The kids want their McNuggets. They want their their pasta. You know, mm -hmm. one of our one of our, the people we work with at Mensa Medical said that she went to babysit um, her nieces and nephews. And she went over to their house and um, they're vegetarians, all right? So she made this wonderful vegetable meal and brought it out. And the kids, and she called the kids to come in for dinner. And the kids looked and said, what is this? And she said, well, it's dinner. She said, they said, well, where's the pizza and where's the pasta? <laughs> I said, Basically, we're talking about carbitarians here. We're not going to eat meat, but we will do that which is actually worse than meat by affecting our glycemic index, our weight, 
um, our blood pressure. Since when is obesity, you know, when I was growing up in med school, obesity was a term we only used for adults. Children who were heavy had a chance of getting over it. There was no obesity. Now we've got obesity as a medical term in children. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, these grains, these, these breads and cereals, which I love, unfortunately, um, they are problematic. We, folks, we just, this is the time. There, there is no more being nice and sugarcoating anything. We have to tell you straight, get off the inflammatory foods. Right now, this is about your survival. This is about our society not only surviving, but hopefully thriving one day again. Part of the reason that we're seeing people drop off with this viral situation, why we're vulnerable, a lot of times we did this ourselves. We put ourselves in these states, okay? Now, whether it's we didn't know any better or there's some people, hey, you were told, you know, and it's like, well, you didn't, you decided you didn't want to change. You enjoy, you know, I, somebody, there's a, there's a Netflix program called the, the Joe Cross story. It's called Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. Wonderful documentary. Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. And um, this guy did this whole vegetable juice thing. He lost a lot of weight. And, you know, he's from Australia. And he encountered a gentleman in America who uh, was in charge of a, a gun store, neither here nor there. But he was a portly fellow. I mean, sizable. And he said, well, don't you think you would, he was interviewing this guy. He said, sir, don't you think you would do better if you lost the weight? And the man said, well, I'll tell you something. My father was a fat man. My uh, mother was a portly young lady. My brother's fat. My grandfather's fat. And I just figure I'm just going to be a jolly old happy fat man till the day I die. And there was nothing that Mr. Cross had to say about this. He's, he's in it. This guy was affable. He was a wonderful, loving human being. And you, you just liked him when you saw him. Um, the interesting thing is, three months after he had that encounter, he called Joe Cross and said, you know what? I've really been thinking. I need to do something different and lose all this weight. Wow. I was so proud of this gentleman and so happy for him because wow. he recognized he really didn't want to lead a shorter life, which was his own words. He said, I'd rather lead a shorter life and be happy than be thinner and lead a long life. Okay. But it's the ramifications of that overweight, obese situation, the, the ramifications of all these difficulties that put us in this state in the first place. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful about our choices. We have to be careful about our attitudes. If life matters to you, then right now you need to do your best mm -hmm. to do everything to preserve that life and to give yourself the best fighting chance. No one goes into battle. No one goes to war saying, no, no, don't give me the best armor. I'll take that armor over there. That's the most minimal thing you got. You know, just as long as it can, it can protect me against butterflies, I'm okay. Forget the artillery, okay? That's not what we're talking about here, okay? We want to gird you up because we are in battle mode now. Mm -hmm. It's a battle for our own survival. As individuals, as a people, as a culture, there, there is no one who's immune from either an ethnic, sexual, or, or otherwise state of existence. Mm -hmm. This thing does not play favorites. Everyone, anyone is susceptible. So Absolutely. now I'm getting off my soapbox, Annie. And yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> up there. I love um, it. And I just, again, I just want to, just want to remind any, everyone, your kitchen is your hospital. Our hospitals are, uh, things are precarious right now. You know, We're, we, we see the reports. Your kitchen is your hospital. Your medicine is your food. You have, you, you are your best advocate. I mean, I say this to our patients all the time. You really are your best advocate. We're here for you. We're cheering you on. Um, we're here to support you. We're here to give you a map, but it's up to you to follow that map and you have the tools. And I, I just, I, I want, I hope that this whole series has been an encouragement to everyone. Um, I hope this whole series has been informative. That's what Dr. Mensa and I wanted to uh, wanted to do, wanted to impress upon you just just the amount, uh, how powerful diet is in healing. And um, uh, I think that, it, you know, maybe even if you're not ready yet, you might be like that gentleman in, in, the, in the film, the Netflix documentary, uh, you know, come back later and say, gosh, you know, I realize that 
I need to th really change my thinking. I, I really need to, to, to focus on my health. And uh, we, we just hope that, that there's been a light bulb or maybe several light bulb moments for you during the course of this series. So um, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sammy. Well, and thanks to both of you. And uh, let me say, uh, having worked with you for several years, Dr. Mensa, um, <laughs> I, I, I just can't believe that, uh, you know, that you're on a soapbox. Uh, it, it's, oh, I it's not you. like you. <laughs> 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 well, we've got, some, we've got some very good questions starting to come in here, uh, specifically related to uh, the information that the two of you have been sharing. And, and one that jumps out right away, um, Dr. Mensa, you were just talking about making um, some specific choices as it relates to diet. And, and so I've got someone who's asking specifically about your opinions on the keto diet um, or also just a carnivore, uh, carnivorous dark diet, but adding in some dark green vegetables a little bit. Um, and this particular person is asking, how do you feel about those diets in general, but also how do you feel about them for folks over 70? I have a lot to say about this, but I'm gonna let Dr. Mensa go first. <laughs> oh, Sammy, you know, I, I could not take that thunder away from you. <laughs> uh, I, I too have some very both personal and um, technical, I guess, considerations that don't always mix. So, uh, Sammy, why don't you go right ahead and start? I'll, I'll kick it after you. Um, my, my initial short answer, and this is what I tell everyone, is that I don't think, um, I think every dietary protocol or, or you know, um, specific way of eating lifestyle, whatever you want to call it, um, has its merits. Um, I, I try not to, you know, say, oh, this is good, this is bad. I don't look at food as good and bad. I think there are um, certain foods that are good for certain people. I think there are things like soda that are not even food. I mean, that's just not food, let's be honest. That's poison. Um, don't put that in your body. Um, but if we're talking about specifically, now let's start with the carnivore diet. Um, some people do do better with more protein in their diet, people that are very active, you know, we've mentioned undermethylation, even though I know we're giving general guidance here, even though we have patients of ours that are watching. I've mentioned that I'm undermethylated. I do better with a higher protein diet, but I also eat a lot of plants. I eat about a pound of vegetables a day at least. Um, uh, you know, there's definitely merits to higher protein and, and the brain for sure. Um, so I, I, I think that they can be good. Now the keto diet, I think can be very good in certain situations. I also think that when we're talking about a senior that is diabetic, um, that uh, you know has uh, lots of very high markers and is very, very inflamed, and we're also seeing cognitive decline, I think a keto diet can be an excellent start. Um, and, and you know, of course, that will shift and change over time. Um, do I think a keto diet long term, and I know I'm probably going to get some hate email about this. Do I think long term it's necessary? No, I think we're human. I think that, like Dr. Mensa said, we, you know, we like certain things. We want to, you know, have, uh, you know, a little bit of a pleasurable dessert once in a while. Um, I, I, I just, I think being really militant with things is what really bothers me about some of these diets, but. I think that it certainly has uh, applications that can be very beneficial in certain disease states. Dr. Mensa, what, what would you? Yes, you know, and today is a day of opposites for me because I'm gonna say some stuff that's quite diametrically opposed to what it is I normally say to our patients. Um, but this is really what's important. Again, do you know what your biochemical status is, is the real question. Eat for your chemistry. Really, it doesn't matter how old you are. Um, if you are uh, an overmethylated person, you go buy yourself a plot of land and graze all day long. You know, um, the, the grass, the paleo, um, 
vegetarianism, veganism, believe it or not. I know Dr. Metz is saying veganism all in the same breath, right? No, if you have that chemistry, that's what you need to do, especially if you've got a mental health condition. Okay, that's where we focus on it. If you don't have these other conditions, then you know what? Then you're pretty much good to go in many different directions. Moderation and balance is almost always best. If you don't know your yes. chemistry is, don't go to an extreme of any diet. Yes. Eat a balance. You can't go wrong there. Okay. That's the way I kind of look at the dietary approach. But to say keto specifically, oh, no, no, no. We got to look at the whole spectrum. Okay. There are plenty of benefits to the, the, uh, the vegetarian lifestyle, plenty of benefits to, to being paleo, plenty of benefits to this and this and this. It depends on who you are, what your need is, what your goal is, and the time frame. Yeah. Again, I'm with Samantha. Extremism doesn't really work too terribly well in any given direction. But some extremes are a little bit better than others, especially if you've got the right chemistry for it. So that's the real first question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add, with regard to keto, now men, we know, respond very differently to keto than women. And uh, my concern with women, and this is, again, this is just what I see in having, having you know, worked in this manner for, gosh, over 11 years now, um, that women tend to need uh, more carbohydrate when they're doing the keto diet than men. Again, our, you know, our, just our hormonal structures are different. Um, one of the things that I notice, uh, you know, and this is just an observation, when you go online, most of the proponents of the keto diet, and again, I'm not saying that keto is bad, okay? So please don't misunderstand me. Most of the proponents of the diet are men. Um, and again, that's not bad either, but it's just from a metabolic perspective, women do respond differently to keto than men. Um, I, I find that especially when we're looking at our thyroid gland, um, uh, we do better with a little bit more carbohydrate. And carbohydrate is not a bad term either. People, uh, I just, I encourage you not to put things into categories of good and bad. There are good starches. There are certainly starches that, you know, I would encourage you not to consume. But there are wonderful starches. I've already mentioned many of them in the winter squash category, uh, zucchini, summer squashes, um, you know, your tubers that can be uh, very beneficial um, and you can still lose weight and by including some of these good starches into your diet. So it's totally, I, I love how Dr. Mintz has said, it really is about moderation, what's best for you, what's going on with your gut. I think most importantly, like what can you tolerate? Some people can't tolerate tubers um, because they're feeding yeast. So we have to take them out. Um, some people are going more protein and fat and lower starch because we're trying to heal SIBO and candida yeah. overgrowth and leaky yeah. gut. So, you know, that's, these are just some things, just a friendly reminder to consider and to think about when we're talking about these types of diets. One other thing I'll say about keto is the reason people feel so great on keto is because they're not triggering bacteria. They've switched their diet. Often they're going from standard American diet to keto and they feel amazing and they go, oh my gosh, wow. Well, there's often, you know, again, there's, there's a removal of foods that are not triggering inflammation in the GI tract. Um, but the GI tract also eventually is going to need a, a wide variety of plant foods to feed those good guys. So when you, when you restrict, um, uh, you know, for a long period of time, that's also going to create microbial imbalances, and that's not good. So this is where I say short term can be great. Um, long term, we really don't have good data there. So just be careful. Samantha, you brought up a great point, And this is something I, I wanted to talk about earlier. So we talk about ingestion. We talk about starting the whole process of, of digestion here in the mind, the esophagus, the mouth, and then the esophagus and the, the stomach. And then the thing is, even with polyphenols, right? They don't just move into your system. Polyphenols have to be processed by the gut bacteria. So if you don't have the proper balance of good and bad microbiota, mm -hmm. no matter what you do, you're not going to get the real effect. And then that might be why so many of you out there say, I tried this particular diet, it didn't work for me. I tried that and it didn't work for me. But you didn't do anything about the microbiome. Yep. So again, that comes into play. We have a very interesting balance of, of wonderful relationships, even within our own GI tract. And 
the foods we eat still need them to do their job in order to help us process and move on. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much for that, Sammy. Oh yes, thank you. I'm glad that you you triggered that in my mind because that is such a huge that that's a big part to the answer of this question, and I want people to really consider. Very good. Um, I've also got uh, a question here that's specific to some of the supplements that the two of you have been speaking about quite a bit, uh, mentioning vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, and, and the importance of making sure that we have um, higher dosages of those during this COVID outbreak. Um, I've got a question asking about vitamin A palmitate and mm -hmm. um, iodine or iodide uh, mm -hmm. also during this outbreak. Uh, if, if those are also things we should be considering to up our dosages on. Okay, I, I want to kind of talk about these uh, a little bit here. Vitamin A is a potent antioxidant, okay? It is a very good thing to have on board. And, you know, uh, dosages can vary depending on your condition and whether you're talking about beta carotene or vitamin A, it's a different story, but yes, vitamin A, very, very good thing. Iodine is an interesting creature. Um, it's got its technical capacities and then it's got its functional usage, usages in our bodies. So I don't know how many of you remember this, but you know, my dad, when I was a kid, if I had a scratch or abrasion, he would take out a bottle of iodine and put it on that wound and it would heal because iodine is an antibacterial construct. And so is iodide that you take into your system. Now you need it predominantly for thyroid function in a major sort of way. And that's one of the areas where I look and I say, well, listen, if you're gonna spend money on a nutrient and you're looking for something for the bang for the buck, if your thyroid is doing okay, and for example, maybe you're not taking in fluoride toothpaste and you don't have fluoridated water, then you probably don't need huge amounts of extra iodine, okay? Um, that is more so for the thyroid and for you know a, a variety of other things, but in terms of dealing with this particular virus per se or, or immune health, it is part of a system, but there are bigger parts to be wielded, I think, that give you more bang for the buck. Uh, vitamin A is one of those as well, so that's, that's a definitely good point. But, um, I look at iodine personally more for um, the, the actual thyroid health than most other you know, situations might be you know, involved. Now, it's interesting, um, the family, the chemical family that iodine sits in. Yes, it sits in the same family as, as um, fluoride and bromide, um, but there's some interesting uses for bromide. I'm not gonna get into this time, but that can be very beneficial for the overall system. But to answer the question fairly simply, I think vitamin A is your bigger bet. And that is certainly a, a good construct to help with your immune health and with this concept of decreasing blood um, stickiness, if you want to call it that, capacities in our bodies. And you know, a good way to get um, just, again, from a food perspective, uh you know get get your seaweeds you you know you can get nori strips you can add those to soups and stews and mm -hmm. you know they they create a nice flavor and and that's going to give you some some of that uh uh you know extra food based source of, of iodine that can be helpful for the thyroid um mm -hmm. and and dr mensa you know with vitamin a always want to be careful about not taking too high of a dose um uh so what, what are your thoughts on that? Because I'm sure people are going to say, well, what's, what's the dose that he, you know, that he would recommend? I, I'm, I'm very cautious around dosing of vitamin A, which is why I kind of said, yes, it is a good thing, but I'm not trying to tell you what dose to take. You know, um, really, I would say that you kind of have to look at less than 2,500, okay? If you're untested, if you've got a bottle of whatever have you, or, or, or a, um, uh, a pill form or whatever have you, really don't go you know, wild on this thing, okay? Um, stay under 2,500, you'll probably be good and it'll probably be very useful for you, okay? But outside of that, 
you started to move into what really doctors should be handling or a therapist or a, a practitioner should be handling for you. Okay. Remember Dr. Uh, William Walsh's uh, book, Nutrient Power. Nutrients are there, but remember, these are what we said at the beginning. They're the same molecules that we talk about for treating pathological conditions. And you do that by using extremely high concentrations. So you can become toxic at some point, and you can't do this willy-nilly. So right now, we're just talking kind of in between. Take it easy on that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I wanted to make sure that people are aware that you have to be careful with vitamin A. So, so thank you for that, Dr. Mensa. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. And Dr. Mensa, now I'm going to chide you a little bit here because Sammy told us to turn off the notifications on our phone and I keep hearing your phone ding. So <laughs> You know, you are correct, Mr. Wells. And I'm uh, take care of that right now. There's one. And, uh, got and a private cell phone. There's two. And all right. <laughs> there we go. We're all set here. Very good. We just have a couple more questions that folks have sent in that we want to make sure that we get to. Um, first off, we've got uh, one of our, <coughs> excuse me, one of our patients um, who is uh, an adult with autism spectrum disorder who is asking specifically about um, the various medications, the, the pharmaceutical medications that he takes, um, you know, Adderall, Lexapro, those types of things, wants to make sure that um, changes in diet, um, the need for increased nutrient intake as we're fighting against COVID isn't going to be impacted by those pharmaceuticals that he's taking during uh, during this uh, during this whole COVID thing as we're adjusting diets and, and nutrients? No, the, the, uh, the nutrients and the diet are not going to adversely affect the medications. Usually we're worried about the opposite, okay? So uh, to make it very simple, there's no real concern around that. If you've got a more specific question, you contact us tomorrow at the office. We can look at your chart and get everything straight for you and then give a very cogent answer to a very specific question. Okay, but thank you. Very good, very good. And then the, the last question that I have here, um, and if anyone wants to get a last minute question in, now's the time to do it. But um, the last question that I have currently uh, is just asking if there's an online list of some of the foods and nutrients and supplements uh, that the two of you have been discussing, if there's a place that folks can go uh, to, you know, either print out a, a program or, or something along those lines. I, I knew that was coming. Sammy, <laughs> <laughs> okay. what, uh, what I wanted to talk to you about also is if maybe we can actually put together some of those things for folks. Yeah, definitely. Post them for them. So, yeah. yeah, we'll we'll put together a PDF. This is what we'll do, and and I'll I'll just throw this together, and um, um, and then we can put it on our websites uh, as a PDF, and then you can download it. So, I'll send this out to my list. We'll put it on our respective social media platforms. Uh, you know, Dr. Mensa, Mr. Wells can can uh, also send that out to to uh, Mensa medical patients, and we'll make sure that you have all that information. That's not a problem. Absolutely, absolutely. This is this is too good stuff to keep, you know, uh, hidden. We've got to unleash all this. Yeah, so we'll do that. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. Um, well, as this is the last of our series with Samantha and and uh, folks, I'll give you uh, just a heads up that I'm going to before we sign off. I want to make you aware that Dr. Mensa and I will be joining you with some other guests in the coming days and weeks as we continue to go through this COVID uh, change in the way that, that uh, we get through life these days. But uh, any last minute things that uh, Samantha you want to share, Dr. Mensa that you wanna share specific to this topic of boosting immune health? Uh, yes, um, during the first pandemic. of all I wanna share that um, Samantha is going to be hosting podcasts coming up. 
So I want you guys to be paying attention. She might have some guests you know every now and then, okay? Uh, but most importantly, she's gonna be sharing her brilliance with you on a regular basis. And I think that's gonna be most excellent. I can't wait personally uh, to hear all the wonderful things and guests that she's gonna have on those podcasts. Sammy, would you like to tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, thank you, Dr. Mensa. I totally forgot about that, so I appreciate the reminder. Um, I Yes, I'm um, very excited. I've been working very hard for the last several months on my Eat for Life podcast, and that's going to be launching in the next couple of weeks. And I've already got a couple of episodes ready to go, and Dr. Mensa is going to be a frequent guest. We're going to be having more conversations like this. We're going to talk about autism in detail. We're going to talk about undermethylation, overmethylation, copper, Pyrol, zinc, you know, all these wonderful things. Infertility is another area that I'm very passionate about that we work with as well. Um, also focusing on our seniors, dementia, Alzheimer's, et cetera. So we're going to be doing, uh, the podcast is every other week right now. Um, I might move into a weekly podcast, um, but just twice a month right now. And we're going to be doing some really deep dives into um, these topics that we presented and a lot of other things that we haven't even talked about that we work with clinically. So um, I'm just, I'm really, really excited and I, I hope that you'll join us. And, and um, like I said, Dr. Mensa has graciously agreed to be uh, a recurring guest so that we can be having these conversations and be informing you so that you understand on a deeper level what we do clinically and what we're, what we're working with and what causes a lot of the conditions that we work with, the underlying chemistry. Again, the nutrient power, um, the overloads and the deficiencies that create a lot of these conditions that we work with, these imbalances that we work with. Um, so yeah, I hope you'll join us, so thank you. Sammy, thank you. you've been a dream. Thank you so much for all of your wonderful wisdom and advice and sharing. And we will be having these conversations again, um, not in a block series all the time, but I know we'll have more of them. Absolutely. So, thank, thank you, you Dr. So Vincent, for having me. And you know, all the best, and we'll be talking to you real soon. Thank you, thanks. everyone. Yes, thanks to everyone who tuned in. Tomorrow, Dr. Mensa and I will be speaking again with Dr. Perry Passaro, a psychologist, uh, and an expert in cognitive behavior therapy to talk more about um, overcoming the anxiety and depression that seem to be very commonplace these days uh, as we wrestle with all of this information and misinformation regarding the COVID pandemic. So please join us tomorrow at four o'clock and again, look for announcements for other uh, broadcasts in the weeks to come where we talk to other experts who can help us navigate this, uh, this new normal that is the COVID-19 outbreak. Sorry, Mr. Wells. I'm yes. so sorry. I have to do this one more time. Go ahead. Not, not to think that you'd find another soapbox to stand on. No, no soapbox, <laughs> but I need your help everyone out there okay look um the australians way back when with the sars virus had a treatment that involved iv vitamin c therapy at extremely high dosages we're talking over uh 24 grams during the course of a day and it worked the chinese recently employed a similar protocol and it worked i need you guys to actually talk to your doctors I need you to talk to all these folks and ask, what about proper dosing, high dose of vitamin C IV? Research studies have shown it because it's so critical. One person can't get this out. But you know what? An army of interested people can. So I'm inviting this army out there. Now, our medical medical protocol involves 24 grams of vitamin C divided over the course of a day, IV, twice a day along with 100 milligrams of zinc, the same, and vitamin D, 20,000 international units. This is an IV. What do you really have to lose if you don't believe in it, right? But if you don't try something that is proven, at least to some degree, the risks are going to be far greater than, excuse me, the other way around, the benefits are far greater than the risks of this. 
talk to your doctors, talk to people you know, spread the word. It's not about waiting for the vaccine while people die. Right, yes. It's not about sitting back and waiting for the drug to come out. People are dying before these things even get approved. But we might be able to do some real work here with the high dose IV therapy. You can quote me on that. You can tell any doctor to give me a call. Okay. Uh, hopefully I'll survive long enough for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a petition going around regarding that, Dr. Mensa. So uh, yeah. I, I saw something this morning about that. So um, uh, I, I just encouraging everyone along the same lines to, to go online, maybe search for petition, vitamin C, IV therapy, COVID-19 whatever um and 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 make your voice known very good thank you so much everyone for tuning in again <laughs> thank you for those of you who are watching later on um we encourage you to share this we'll put this up uh on the mensa medical facebook page uh and our youtube channel sometime later tonight or first thing tomorrow um so you will have access to it feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues as well. Thanks yeah, so much. Going to put that last part on the blooper reel or something? or <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Thanks again to everyone, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Bye now. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>